Hey everyone, it's Eric here and today we are joined with uh, Harry Merle who has recently published his book Cognitive Personality Theory and we are going to be discussing the problem with the four function model of cognitive functions. So it is my great pleasure to collaborate with my friend Eric Thor in a video breaking down the differences between CPT and Eric's flow model of personality. However, however, I'm not going to be describing this in a top-down list. I don't believe in functional hierarchies. I don't believe in this one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight list of cognitive functions assigned in a descending order based upon this kind of arbitrary preference for one over another. First and foremost, what I want you all to know is Carl Jung did not invent the eight function, cognitive function hierarchy as we know it today. While Carl Jung came to establish the foundation and the, most of the theory we know today on the cognitive functions, he did not assign on a hierarchy which cognitive function was the strongest in preference in each individual personality type. Neither did Isabella Briggs establish a cognitive function hierarchy in the 40s. When Isabella Briggs took over Carl Jung's work and launched the 16 personality types, she did not actually make a statement on which cognitive functions were the strongest in which personality type. The one that came to establish the cognitive function hierarchy as we know it today was in fact John Beebe, influenced by Maslow's hierarchy of needs. He put together a hierarchy of cognitive functions. Eight cognitive functions arranged on a scale for each individual personality type, showing which cognitive functions were the strongest in terms of consciousness in a personality type. Now, let's start with the dominant function. So first, let's take the dominant function in relation to the oppositional function. So the dominant function is a convergent function. In CPT, convergence describes having conscious responsibility for a function. It is used as part of the ego complex in order to make new connections, in order to find new novel ways of perceiving, of doing things, in order to, essentially, it is a highly creative attitude. Whereas as the opposite of the dominant, the oppositional function is highly divergent. Therefore, it is more negativistic. It is consequence instilling. It's not creative, it's much more rigid. And it serves as a kind of authority, not only to compel the dominant function with an agenda, but also to anchor the dominant function into reality, to stop the dominant function getting too carried away with itself. The dominant function is by far the greatest degree to which CPT can overlap with other systems because I view it in a very similar kind of way to other systems. It is a central part of our ego complex. It is the state that we most commonly reside within. And the cognitive magnetism towards a dominant function is definitely higher than any other function. Even though cognitive magnetism does vary very much according to context, we will always be drawn towards the embrace, if you like, of our dominant function. I often call the dominant functions the flow functions, and I emphasize functions because I mean there are several, more than one function to talk about here. The flow functions are definitely creative in their role in the sense that the energy comes from within. It is intrinsically motivated, self-starting. It is something that comes from within outwards rather than something that is triggered from external stimulus or from other people telling you to do something or to like something or to feel a certain way. You just feel it. You just care about it. You just have this and it just comes off naturally in you no matter what the situation is. It's just there to be drawn out. And to be able to explain this dynamic any further, I must now visit the oppositional function and the role this function usually plays. The oppositional function, known as the inferior for some reason in other systems, is actually incredibly multifaceted. It can actually play more than one possible role within the human psyche. So let's take the default role. The default role of the oppositional function is like an anchor. It's an anchor into reality. It's something to prevent the dominant stack from getting too carried away in its creativities. Extrovert sensing in an INFJ such as myself will compel me to ground myself in reality. It serves as a check and balance system to ensure that I never dwell entirely within an overly abstract mental state. It ensures that the concoctions within my mind have an extroverted sensing feedback. Therefore, there's a constant give and take between extroverted sensing, the anchor, and the dominant function of introverted intuition. If the dominant function is the flow function in my model, the inferior function is the stress function. It is activated through stress. It takes stress to maintain it. 
it serves as stress or an anxiety in the sense that it is something that warns us about something. It is something that tells us to slow down. It is something that reins us in. It is definitely something grounding. It is definitely something that steadies us. It is definitely something that makes us uh, zoom out of a situation. But it is still a natural part of our identity. We tend to identify and experience most consciously our strongest highs and our lowest lows. The things we remember the most in our lives are both our most positive memories and our most negative. That means we are the most aware of the role of our flow functions and our stressors inside of ourselves. The second role my oppositional plays is as my primary external lens. My primary external lens isn't extroverted intuition because my intuition, which is the same function, it doesn't matter whether it's extroverted or introverted, it's still the same function, is pulled internally. Therefore, any kind of extroverted intuitive gazing I will be doing will be at the expense of my introverted intuition. And yes, while it is possible for me to employ extroverted intuition in a highly conscious manner, it is not natural to do so. It is less intuitive than employing extroverted sense. So since extroverted sensing is my primary lens, this gives me a very intense gaze. This gives any extroverted sensing opposition, whether they're an INTJ, INFJ, or anything in between, a very intense focus. Therefore, the gaze is not only extremely focused, but it's also looking at you specifically as if you've just tugged me away from abstract reality back into the con, and I'm completely and utterly fixated on you. I'm completely and utterly fixated in this instance on the camera lens. This is extrovert sensing. I'm not gazing everywhere around the room. I'm locking into specific things. The second role my oppositional plays is as my primary external lens. My primary external lens isn't extrovert intuition because my intuition, which is the same function, it doesn't matter whether it's extroverted or introverted, it's still the same function, is pulled internally. Therefore, any kind of extroverted intuitive gazing I will be doing will be at the expense of my introverted intuition. And yes, while it is possible for me to employ extroverted intuition in a highly conscious manner, it is not natural to do so. It is less intuitive than employing extroverted sensing. So since extroverted sensing is my primary lens, this gives me a very intense gaze. This gives any extroverted sensing oppositional, whether they're an INTJ, INFJ, or anything in between, a very intense focus, and often what could be considered frightening or even intimidating gaze, because we look very specifically. It's a hyperdivergent extroverted sensing, and therefore the gaze will always be accompanied with this kind of annoyance that you've pulled us away from our abstract reality. Therefore, the gaze is not only extremely focused, but it's also looking at you specifically as if you've just tugged me away from abstract reality back into the concrete. And I'm completely and utterly fixated on you. I'm completely and utterly fixated, in this instance, on the camera lens. This is extrovert sensing. I'm not gazing everywhere around the room. I'm locking into specific things. So, so far we have the oppositional playing the role of an anchor, and we also have the oppositional, in my case, playing the role of a lens. Conversely, in a codec dominant, such as an INFP or ENFJ, the oppositional function would instead be performing the role as the primary external, or in the case of the ENFJ, internal codec. This is a different ball game, but it's still performing the role as an anchor into reality and a means by which the person can primarily connect with the world opposite to their dominant orientation. Yeah, if extroverted sensing is your oppositional function, you might be described as generally inattentive. But in areas that come from and start with your flow function, you will instead show a sense of hyperattentiveness. Your stress functions can be manifested in particularly extreme ways in order to serve the interests of your flow function working as kind of the undercurrent of your personality. The intense gaze of an INFJ or an INTJ may come from, in part, that when we are interested in something or when we are working with a concept or a model to understand something, we show hyper-attentiveness to things that fit within this model. Yet another role of the oppositional function is contained within a very important feedback loop between it and the dominant. In this instance, we have the opposite orientation of the oppositional function. Therefore, to take myself again, an INFJ, I have introverted intuition. But this introverted intuition isn't just in this island by itself in the middle of this vast ocean. No, it is intrinsically connected to the oppositional function of the same orientation, introverted sensing. Introverted sensing isn't this demonic function. It isn't this evil, strange, mythologically informed 
function performing an unconscious but highly mischievous role within my psyche, manifesting its various different complexes. No, not at all. It is a function intrinsically connected to the effective employment of my introverted intuition. If I was just using introverted intuition without introvert sensing, because remember it's a continuum between introvert intuition and introvert sensing, so abstract versus concrete, I would not be able to perceive any kind of detail. I would not even be able to hone into specific words in order to effectively communicate to you what I'm thinking. No, just introverted intuition by itself is just vague, plethoric, and it cannot hone into details. Without a feedback loop between introverted intuition and introvert sensing, I would be completely useless. Same goes for introvert sensing, and let's say, for argument so can ISFJ. If this individual was just using introvert sensing as a dominant function, they would not be able to perceive any kind of connection to a larger picture. They'll just be looking at specific details or specific memories, specific concrete realities within their internal landscape and just seeing them at face value, not making any kind of connections, not drawing a connection between one thing and another, not even sufficient as to employ heuristics. Both functions need each other. Every function and every single continuum needs the other one, whether it's one orientation or the other. And therefore the third role the oppositional function plays is actually as an integral part of the dominant function. The dominant function isn't on this island, remember. A dominant function is on a continuum, and therefore a dominant function is actually a portion of that continuum that is rotating between a high degree of introvert intuition in this case, and a small degree of introvert sensing. And yes, it is even possible for me to employ a high degree of introvert sensing and vice versa. And this is why I stress a more fluid approach to psychology. So when we talk about the cognitive functions, we normally talk about the dominant, which I've called flow function, an inferior, which I've called a stress function, an auxiliary and a tertiary. The auxiliary tends to serve as the primary goal or mission that the person is striving towards, and the tertiary tends to serve as the primary tool a person seeks to employ in order to achieve that mission. What I've found with this is that introverted sensing and introverted thinking serve relatively similar roles in an INFJ. Introverted sensing and introverted thinking are constantly employed by the INFJ as long as they are able to achieve the dominant values of the INFJ or deal with the dominant problems or challenges of the INFJ. INFJs are great at influencing or using introverted thinking and introverted sensing when it is in their natural interests or when it is used to stop or prevent bigger problems or issues. But besides that, outside of that, introverted sensing and introverted thinking are relatively boring. And finally, my fourth favorite, if there is such a thing, role of the oppositional function is to actually play a role as an alternative dominant function. If you rotate on your axis to your oppositional function, so in my case, extrovert sensing, you become the opposite type. You become, in my case, an ESTP type while you're engaging that. Yes, you're probably not going to do it for very long. Yes, the cognitive magnetism of introverted intuition is always going to pull you back towards your normal state relative to your own individuation process, of course. But to varying durations of time, the oppositional function can actually become the dominant. I can become an extrovert sensing dominant and thus using extrovert sensing and extrovert feeling, the codec to which it is attached, in a convergent manner. I'm not only observing the external world, I'm actually taking responsibility for it and playing an active role. This is how I connect with other people. This is how I have very intense one-on-one -on -one conversations, interactions. This is how I would play a video game. This is how I'd play my guitar, for example, as a musician. This is how I would perform to a crowd of people. And conversely, let's say an ENFJ rotates on their axis to become a more ISTP-like personality type. This is how they would navigate in a convergent manner their internal world. This is how they would take responsibility for their internal frameworks. Yes, when we get older, the inferior function often tends to start to serve as the role, the identity the INFJ will take on in order to express their values and interests to the outer world. The INFJ learns that they must get the attention of the collective around them. The tribe must hear them, must see their ideas, must see the value of their ideas. So the INFJ must go out on stage, must get attention to themselves, must put themselves in a position where they become interesting and appealing to other people by simply being stronger, better, faster, smarter, 
or more intelligent or more valuable than other people in their tribe. And now let's take the auxiliary functions. Yes, functions, plural. I completely depart from any system that labels a specific function as the auxiliary of the cognitive stack, especially if that function is only one orientation. So is my extrovert feeling as an INFJ my auxiliary function? Yes, but it isn't auxiliary to my introvert intuition, it's auxiliary to my extrovert sensing. It's a divergent function that instills consequence. It compels me to abide by social norms, and it is only when I'm employing it in a convergent manner that it becomes a convergent auxiliary, but it is when I'm employing it in a convergent manner that I'm also employing extrovert sensing a lot of the time in a convergent manner. And thus, it is the convergent auxiliary to my extrovert sensing when I rotate on my axis. How I see this in terms of the auxiliary is the auxiliary serves us with the important mission we have to follow, the values we have to abide by, the actions we have to take, the decisions we have to make in order to be successful people. Often it says and instills us with a sense of consequence and you have to be more like this. You have to change this about yourself. You have to improve that. You have to work on this. And in so the auxiliary functions represent what we strive towards, what we constantly work towards, but never completely embody or inhibit as people. We are constantly working to be more vulnerable, to be better, to be stronger, to be smarter and the auxiliary serves the role of growth, helping challenge us and set us with challenges and tasks and missions that we have to overcome or accomplish in order to grow. The auxiliaries are functions that we value and want to improve at and want to better ourselves in. These are functions that take vulnerability. We have to step outside of our comfort zone to access them. We have to put ourselves in a situation where we have to grow or learn or improve or better ourselves. Where we have to stretch ourselves further than what we feel comfortable. Be more extroverted, be more outgoing, be stronger, be smarter than what we currently are. When we look at the auxiliary function, we see a hill that we need to climb. When we look at the tertiary function, we see a beach that we can go and lay down at. While we can definitely argue chicken or the egg analogies for as long as we want to, I'm going to say external information begins. So no matter whether you're an extrovert or an introvert, your process always begins with the perception of external information. Therefore, yes, my extrovert sensing and extroverted feeling are perceiving social information. So extrovert sensing details, concrete experiences gone through the filter of my extrovert feeling diversion auxiliary. And then these authority functions, these divergent auxiliary and authoritative role within my stack feed into my introverted intuition and introvert thinking frameworks and inform my ego complex's agenda. My agenda is to the concrete social experience. Therefore, I'm trying to make sense of humanity. I'm trying to make sense of the people in my life. I'm trying to envisage ideal social situations, ideal communal situations, situations in which I can impact people on a large scale and serve an important role within society. Yeah, it tends to work exactly like that. It is first that I see that people need something from me, people expect something from me, humanity wants something from me, and then I try to think up a logical method in which I can solve that problem. And that's also how I know that I'm a feeling type. My primary goals are feeling in their nature, while the methods I employ to solve those goals are thinking in their nature. And isn't that crazy? So I don't fully understand where the auxiliary function of MBTI came from, but I know it wasn't from Jung. Jung himself stated that the auxiliary function is of the same orientation as the dominant. It is auxiliary to the dominant function. It isn't auxiliary to your behavior, but rather auxiliary to your cognition. I don't fully understand where the tertiary thing came from either. Maybe it's because in a lot of people, this function's fairly unactivated. And therefore it kind of comes third maybe in a person's development and i sort of see the logic there but within cpt this tertiary function is the conversion auxiliary it is auxiliary to the dominant whereas my extrovert feeling is auxiliary to my extrovert sensing and thus being a part of my divergent stack my introvert thinking is auxiliary to my introverted intuition and thus a part of my conversion stack 
I primarily take responsibility for my introverted intuition and my introvert thinking. Therefore, I form visions, I form big picture kaleidoscopes, and then contain that information within my own constructed frameworks, which I tend to be quite protective of. Basically, when you work from the cognitive function hierarchy, the question is, what is really our identity? If you focus purely on what I'm doing, it's easy to assume that I'm a thinking type. But if you instead focus on the goals I serve and the mission I'm on, then I'm obviously a feeling type. If you look at my energy, it is obviously that I can be very extroverted on camera. But if you look at my process, it is obvious that I spend a lot of time on the drawing board formulating theories before I go out on camera to talk to other people. However, the question is, what side of me do you see? Do you know me from real life, where I tend to take a long time to respond, where I tend to process a lot, and where I tend to weigh a lot of options? Or do you know me from the camera, where I tend to be quiet on the spot, talking, sharing, and cutting to give you an outgoing energy, a quick-paced video with lots of discussion and reaction and energy to get you excited about the message. But all the creative work tends to be done by my internal structures, by my introvert intuition and introvert thinking. It is these two functions serving as the dominant stack, serving as they do within the dominant stack, that seek to create new patterns. They seek to find new ways of doing things and they are the creative functions, they are the convergent functions. Whereas my extrovert sensing and extrovert feeling so my divergent lens and divergent codec. As a default state, these functions are more observational, but depending on the way I'm engaging my oppositional function, as I was talking about previously, the state of these functions can change. They can become convergent or they can stay divergent. They can perform as an anchor into reality. They can inform the agenda of my dominant stack, etc. But here's where we get a little bit more complicated. Both codecs can be used by either lens. Yes, I'm saying that correctly. We can employ either codec that we like to. In order to do so, we need to let go of the codec to which we are primarily compelled towards. And that will naturally allow the other codec to rise to the surface of either consciousness or just simple magnitude. So again, I'll use myself as an example. The INFJ would not ordinarily be employing their introverted feeling alongside their introverted intuition. That would be the conversion stack of the INTJ. Instead, the INFJ would have their feeling function oriented externally and thus be rather oftentimes blind to what's going on within themselves. But this doesn't mean they cannot activate an introverted feeling. It just means they have to engage with introverted intuition and subsequently drop introverted thinking. And then the codec that becomes available is introverted feeling instead. Will it be relatively unconscious? Yes but that doesn't mean it won't inform the introverted intuition. But that doesn't stop the type from gazing predominantly into its limbic circuits rather than its sahibal circuits. Likewise, it is very possible for an INFJ to use extroverted thinking alongside extroverted sensing. In order to do that, the INFJ must engage with a situation in a concrete reality, employing the very detailed, very specific extroverted sensing scope, and then allow themselves to drop their extroverted feeling. The less people they're around, the easier it is to do so, but it is still possible even when in a company of other people who you want to impress or abide by to let go of extroverted feeling and allow extroverted thinking to rise naturally to the surface. And likewise, I can use extroverted thinking through extroverted intuition, which I do usually, and conversely use introverted feeling alongside introverted sensing. In fact, I do that more often than I do introverted intuition with my introvert feeling. But I must point out this is something of a minefield and therefore I'm not going to fully explore this topic within the context of this video. And if I do explore this topic thoroughly, it would be in regards to specific types, specific examples, and then you can go through the type psyche and explore thoroughly the different manifestations dependent upon context, dependent upon the individual's social archetype, which is a completely separate entity to cognitive type and focus specifically on that individual. Because like I said, it's too much of a minefield, too much of an asteroid field, if you like. There's too many variables in order to say across the board how every single type will be acting. Because it depends on context, it depends on specific situations which you need to... Yeah, to me it depends on your flow or motivation. We cannot longer 
claim ourselves to be one singular cognitive function or one singular aspect. We cannot just reference our dominant function and say this is who I am. As we get older we have to start forming a more inclusive and holistic sense of identity, including both strengths and weaknesses, including both goals and methods, including both roles we play and roles we enjoy, <laughs> talking about both how we are under flow and both how we are under stress talking about what grounding mechanisms we tend to experience as well as what key goals we tend to follow and what we tend to constantly find ourselves working towards. We need to work towards seeing ourselves as whole beings with everything we need inside of us to be successful rather than singular beings with only one or two cognitive functions that we can rely on and trust in facing problems and dealing with the external world. So now I want to really thank Harry for joining me on my channel. I want to say it's really important that people hear this message because we tend to hold on to many false beliefs about how the human mind works, who we are, how we can define ourselves, how we can define other people. We tend to hold to stereotypical or simplistic notions about ourselves and other people, focusing only on one or two cognitive functions, focusing on and describing the psyche as something that is in conflict rather than something that is constantly working inside of you to resolve your problems and to deal with issues around you. People tend to believe that the psyche is something at war, when in reality it is something that is constantly trying to help you deal with the things that you are constantly messing up. <laughs> now, with this, I want to say, if you haven't already, check out Harry Merle's book on cognitive personality theory. I will link it in the description down below. And share this video with other people you believe need to hear this message. Thanks everyone for watching and see you all in the next video.